Susan, we really need to understand the human brain. It's the great new frontier of science, and uh, so much uh, is dependent upon it uh, for human well-being, for uh, uh, sickness and disease in so many ways. Uh, what are some of the, the core areas that we need to, uh, to appreciate in understanding the uniqueness of how the brain works? Well, of course, there's many different approaches. Many neuroscientists would have their own take. My particular penchant is for looking at these neuronal assemblies because I think at the moment they haven't been really investigated properly. They've only really just been discovered in the last 10 or 20 years. Only now do we have the techniques really for measuring them. Now, tell me what a neural assembly okay, is. Okay, so a neuronal assembly I'm defining as a coalition, a highly evanescent coalition of brain cells, probably 10 to 100 million, that are recruited up and then disband in less than a second. Okay. Um, and my own view is that this is the mid-level organization of the brain that links on the one hand the hardwired local neuronal networks that are quasi-permanent and local, slow to form, and the macro-scale brain regions that you'd see with non-invasive brain imaging, um, that where our brains would look very similar, where the individuality comes in, where the dynamism comes in, where the constant, incessant shifting and changing comes in is at this mid-level that links those two, the so-called top-down and bottom-up approaches. Now, why I find assemblies very exciting, not only do I believe, well, not believe sounds wrong, not only am I suggesting that they are um, very appropriate correlates of degrees of consciousness, but it enables us to think about what would happen if an assembly was very big or very mm. small. Mm. What kind of consciousness would you have? Oh. So it's, it's a kind of Rosetta Stone. Yeah, um, and if it's a good, and if it is a good Rosetta Stone, you should be able to go from the physiology. What would happen? Let's predict what kind of conscious you'd have if you had a small or large assembly, or conversely. So do that. So give, yeah, me, yeah. give me examples. Or you could interpret something in terms of assembly size. So should we do that? Okay, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, let's absolutely. go both ways. Right, right. So let's, because we're scientists, we mm -hmm. have to always have a caricature approach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's say, what would happen if you had a very small assembly? Well, you can have a small assembly for lots of different reasons. One is you just don't have the connections there, like in a small child. One is that the trigger for it, like a stone in a puddle, isn't very strong. There's mm. nothing external mm. coming in. Let's say like a dream where it's dependent on the intrinsic. Yeah? Another could be where the chemicals that help those cells be recruited is aberrant. These modules, and um, one could think of the chemical dopamine and schizophrenia, for example. Mm. So one could say, well, what do children and um, schizophrenia and dreaming all have in common? Another one might be where so much is happening, the assembly doesn't have time to form. Fast-paced sports, oh, for oh. example. Yeah. Now let's think about that. What do young children, schizophrenics, what, what might they all have, have, in common. It, have in common? And my own suggestion, because we're, <laughs> we're just sort of chatting on this and I don't have all the slides to show, is that all of them are living in the moment. Yeah, They're all in the in the here and now, for whatever reason. A very small child mm. is in the here and now. Um, we know that schizophrenia and childhood are very similar um, in that they're easily distracted, they have short attention spans, they can't think metaphorically and so on. And we know that, schizoph we know that schizophrenia people are, have a very strong sensory emphasis on the world rather than a, a, a so-called cognitive one. So one could suggest that for these different reasons, this is characterizing the small assembly world. And my own suggestion is that when you're doing a fast-paced sport, you are in the small yeah. assembly world. Now, the small assembly world, what's it characterized by? High emotion. You're excited or you're aroused or you're, let's hope, happy in many ways. Very strongly dominated by the senses. And what you see is what you get. Yeah, you've blown your mind. There's, there's no personalized significance to it. So that would be one prediction. And what would be the opposite then? What would a large assembly be? What would be something where you were disengaged from the outside world, where the senses weren't playing much part, where there was a very persistent um, and enduring sense of self, um, and everything seemed remote and grey, and that would be clinical depression. Yeah. Oh, yeah? Yeah. So in clinical depression, we know that people, it's not that they feel sad, they feel numb, they feel emotionally numb. Mm. You know, How some, about meditation? They, well, they'll come on to it and say, so they say anhedonia. Anhedonia is a lack of pleasure. Mm -hmm. which is a, Now, meditation, I think, is further still. It's where you can so exclude the outside world, not that I meditate, but, that every, and you have a very deep consciousness then, of course. So the small assembly world is very shallow consciousness, and it's driven very much by the outside world from moment to moment. You have no sense of self-meditation. You have very deep insights. You're not dependent at all on the outside world. So I think you can think of it that way. We can also go in reverse 
and say, let's think of something and try and explain it in terms of assemblers. And the area that I find very interesting is pain, because we've all felt pain. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And now pain is very interesting, and we can explain this in terms of assemblers. For example, your pain threshold can vary at different times of the day. Why? And this is done from very sadistic experience on, I think, probably bankrupt students where you <laughs> put electric shocks in their teeth and <laughs> how much you have to jack up the current before they feel the pain. Yeah. And uh, just in, if you're interested, the middle of the day is the best time to, feel, <laughs> to go to the dentist. Yeah. Now, it's not that the conduction velocity of the pain fibres changes. It's more those modulating chemicals that fluctuate mm. with biorhythms will mm. be modifying things. We know that pain is largely absent in dreams. Yeah? Mm -hmm. We know that um, morphine, a famous analgesic, gives you a dream-like euphoria. And we know that morphine works on so-called encephalin um, transmission systems, which actually could reduce the size of the assembly. We know that anesthetics will reduce the assembly altogether. I've done that experiment. Mm. Yeah. So what I'd like to suggest is the degree of pain you feel is linked to the size of an assembly. And we know, again, from some heartless experiments done on schizophrenic people, they have a higher threshold of pain. Depressed people have a much lower threshold mm. of pain. And that's, that's and pain. Because sure. And that would be because of the size of their assemblies. Mm. Yeah? Mm. And then finally, the way one can round the circle there, is you could say, well, okay, if that's the case, if you were being given an anesthetic, bizarrely, you would expect... As the anaesthetic was coming on, the assembly was shrinking, you would be going through, ha ha, um, you know, states of excitement and of pleasure and of madness. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's exactly what you did mm -hmm. with anaesthesia. In the old days, you went through hyperexcitability, mm -hmm. delirium, mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. And indeed, in the old days, in fairs, people would actually have nitrous Nitro oxide to right. take, or there'd be ether frolics, right. and the drug would use ketamine, mm -hmm. um, get taken in low doses and high doses in anaesthetic, mm -hmm. of course. Mm -hmm. So... Bizarrely, although it's counterintuitive, that would fit with the idea mm. that degree of pain can actually be related to size of assembly. Yeah. You mentioned uh, sensation from the outside world and mm -hmm. emotions, which is yes. an internal, yes. bo both of which are inversely proportional to uh, consciousness. When they go yeah. up, consciousness goes yeah. down and, yeah. and vice versa. Yeah. So this... Distinguish those for me. Sen yeah. they, they, they are different. Uh, sure. Uh, so, well, uh, you know, sensory information comes from the outside. Emotions come from sure. inside. Of different sure. feeling to them. Sure. Yeah. Well, we know that emotions must be pretty basic because look at the tail wagging dog or mm -hmm. the purring cat, you know, or, or the um, the gurgling baby. Mm. Now they're not solving differential equations, but they are obviously having some kind of right. emotional state. Um, don't get me wrong. I don't think one has no emotion. We're not robots. But on the other hand, people who are very depressed feel emotionally numb. Mm. They feel completely devoid of things. So my own suggestion is that if you're living engaged very much and interacting with your senses coming in, that makes you very excited. And then that is related to small assemblies and in turn where emotions are the, are the dominant feature. But then as your connections grow and as assemblies get larger, my suggestion then is the more cognitive take on the world will sort of suppress, you know, it's like the, you know, it's sort of like arm wrestling, will sort of mm. suppress the emotional um, side, the strong emotions. But we mustn't confuse feeling something with strong emotions. You're feeling something all the time, but a strong emotion is where something is dominant over erstwhile rational or cognitive takes on the And world. the fact that the sensory information comes from the outside and we're somewhat passive in receiving it, and the emotion comes from the inside and self-generated, that's not a critical difference because they're both affecting the assemblies and the consciousness yeah, in a similar way? Yeah, I think what happens is that, of course, the emotions come from inside, where else would they mm, come from? Yeah, right. um, but it's just whether the wick is turned up high or mm -hmm. low. Mm -hmm. And the wick can be turned up high if you're living in a world or engaged with the environment that is potentially life-threatening or um, promoting copulation or eating. It's going to make mm -hmm. you very excited and very engaged with that. And so, therefore, the emotion of living in the moment, I think, is where the wick is turned up high. That's not to say that when you're reading a book or you're having a grand theory about consciousness, you're not feeling anything. Mm -hmm. of, course, of course you are. Mm -hmm. But the dominant, the dominant right, feature... Right, right is no longer this raw, aroused mm. state mm. where you can literally lose your mind or blow your mind when it's at its most extreme. Mm. Mm.